Welcome back to The Green Rush, two-hour weekly live cannabis business talk show produced by Pro Cannabis Media. I'm Josh Kincaid with The Talking Hedge. We got Christopher Smith. Christopher, you're back with us. How you doing, bud? You're still here. I am. I'm still hanging. We're talking this week about events. Uh, Washington State, you know, and everyone else has not had an event. I'm in Seattle, uh, event-free during the pandemic, but uh, we just had a craft cup. Uh, I was a judge for that. So we were down in uh, Soto, uh, kind of celebrating that on a, on a smaller scale. And then just last weekend, I went to Portland for the uh, the Leaf magazine in Portland. They had a Leaf Cup. So I think it was called the Portland Leaf Bowl. Went down there, they had an open bar, and then you could go outside and consume cannabis. In the meantime, on the stage, there were awards. So kind of a nice little... Uh, you know, small, compact place where you can congregate, see people you had not seen in a couple of years. People are getting awards left and right. Um, and that's kind of the scene for the Northwest there. We really don't have big Emerald Cups. Hemp Fest is no longer COVID wiped them out. I don't think they're going to come back. And so that's really it. Uh, there's speed dating for producer process and retailers, but that's not a consumer or consumption facing event. So based, you know, where I'm at in, in the Northwest, uh, very little, even in BC, uh, the Grow Up Conference had uh, something in, in Vancouver Island, uh, but even, um, or Victoria, but even Vancouver doesn't have a whole lot going on. So I'm looking for things to kind of ramp up a little bit more. Uh, I don't know really what that means, but in the meantime, I'm kind of flying into Vegas for MJ BizCon, uh, you know, the big event we just kind of talked about. And then maybe the Emerald Cup, that seems kind of cool. I've never been there. Have you? I haven't been there, but uh, I just, uh, just last week interviewed Tim Blake. He's the founder of the Emerald Cup, as a matter of fact, and his daughter, Taylor. Um, and uh, so they're very fired up about it. They're holding it this year in uh, Hollywood in a big theater, as a matter of fact. Um, Woody Harrelson is getting a special award. He's one of the judges. He's got a dispensary opening uh, very soon. So it all ties together nicely. You know, those entertainment guys, they really tie their stuff together perfectly. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a growing event. It's an exciting event. It's Emerald Cup, of course, is really uh, about the growers, right? Because it's about picking the best uh, the best strains and and that kind of stuff. But interesting, what, what Tim told me, interestingly, this year was... Um, that they are going away from the sort of the high THC kind of, you know, the highest THC is the best sort of thing. And they're really branching out and diversifying and looking at plants in a whole different way um, uh, and with regard to terpenes, et cetera. So they're just, they're, they're just looking at it in a much more, it just they're developing a deeper, deeper understanding of the plant and it just becomes more interesting every single year. I love that. Yeah, I talked to a, a company today who just found a new molecule, not cannabinoid, but sesqui, sesqui terpenes. That one? No, this is um, uh, Juva Life, and they've they've called it Juva nineteen and Juva forty Juva forty one, oh and they're saying that the entourage effect is is bunk. It's, it has nothing to do with THC. It has everything to do with what's in the THC. So I, I like. I mean, it's way over my head, you know, like I, I, I'm not talking okay. science, but these guys really know what they're doing. They're publicly traded and uh, they're talking about huge, huge opportunities. So, um, yeah, I'm kind of excited to even dive back into that chat uh, that I had earlier today. Wow. Um, but comparing Emerald Cup to uh, a, a more wholesale event like hall of flowers where you can kind of go in and you get samples. Like I've seen some of these folks on social media and the swag bags are phenomenal and what you can get. I think it's something where you, it's like a fair, you go in, you give them cash, you get tickets. And then with the tickets, you get to exchange products. And then you can also win additional tickets or something to get more products. And so this is a way for kind of um, uh, other folks in the industry to sample, I guess. Is it, do you know, is it designed for Cons like for the, the general consumer or is it more for wholesale? I think it's really industry people. I don't, I don't yeah. think it's a general, like a farmer's market. I, or, or, no. or, I don't think <laughs> no. that's the intention of it. And, mm -hmm. and I, I remember, was it last year or was it even this year where there was even some people arrested, there was a whole bus that went down the, um, you know, law enforcement is still like, you know, sort of like, they got one foot on the gas and one foot on the brake because they don't know what to do with cannabis just yet. You know, they still want to bust as bad as, you know, but they know that they're not really supposed to. So 
Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, there, I know there was there was some of that sort of uh, conflict or confusion, but it's important, I think, to be able to have events like that where we're all in the same room. We're all, we're all able to share and work and ha- and work with each other and 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 bring each other up. I think those those things are so important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, there's just been a shift or evolution in the industry where I think event planners kind of came in, they realized that the money really wasn't there from local producers or processors, retailers, whatever. Uh, Dope Cup, for example, Dope Magazine that was acquired by High Times and then basically shelved or whatever. They had a massive following, which is why they got acquired. And the Dope Cup, and they would get um, a really big musician on there uh, and then he'd give awards and it was really about the the culture around that and so I, I think that that's sort of missing or something that the emerald cup is embracing that you know hemp fest sort of failed to capitalize on i have friends who love cannabis and love um music but don't go to hemp fest i think emerald cup is really kind of excelling on that and maybe they could learn from that create more more opportunities but i think events are here they just need to be produced better uh, and so with that, there's maybe more opportunities. I don't know. Yeah, I think the, it, it, we're, we are a, a, a complete, I don't know if we're completely unique, but we are an interesting group, right? Because there is the cannabis industry and there's the cannabis community, mm-hmm. right? And so, and it's so diverse what cannabis is able to do and what cannabis is able to serve um, that it is, um, it's, it, there, there's the, the tension between those two things, right? Between the solid industry players, profit and loss, la la la, and and people that are just, you know, the the legacy uh, folks and the people who have been growing, the small farmers, that kind of thing. So that tension continues to exist, and I'm glad to see that there are events that serve these small groups, small farmers, small um, retailers, etc. Um, you know, that keep those uh, those types of businesses alive. It's important. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thomas Wynn Stanley, VP of Marketing with Theory Wellness is with us. Thomas, thanks for being with us. How are you? Hey, yeah, I'm great. Thanks for having me on a Friday. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you got going on? Oh, boy. We're uh, busy as usual, coming off the back of a, an interesting 420 this year, looking at a lot of different expansions into some of these hot new East Coast markets. Uh, new Jersey, we're lined up on Ohio, more Midwest, obviously. And then, you know, everything is coming into play now. And it's a really interesting time in the industry because in Massachusetts, you have a lot of new states with some, what I would consider Massachusetts now more mature state. The landscape is changing really, really quickly. Everything from price reductions and the final the final kind of reducing reduction of pricing that we've seen has been so elevated the last few years. Um, it's a very, very interesting time. And we're seeing this very an interesting kind of growth in the event space, um, which is really, really interesting to see. Um, and I think it really bodes well, I think, for a broader reach for product and category um, that, you know, hopefully theory is going to be a part of it when the time really comes. Have you guys been hosting a lot of 420 parties over the last several years? You know, we haven't. And a lot of it just comes back to the fact that we Uh-oh. You guys frozen? I'm not. Yeah, I'm not hearing him. Yeah. I think we lost his signal for for a period here. Tell oh goodness. Here. He's back. I am. I'm here. Yeah. Sorry back about that. Back. All right. Back. I was asking um, about the 420. If you guys were uh, were hosting parties or um, events on 420. Yeah. Sorry. Um. Yeah. We we don't. We didn't really do too much event work this year, and a lot of it comes down to compliance. Uh, compliance and regulations where it's really, really hard to be vertically integrated with the amount of license we have and do events where really consumption is is probably one of the most exciting drivers. Even when we've had pop-ups with food vendors or other retail, they don't necessarily perform as well as, as one would hope. Um, and so I think one of the big things Massachusetts is moving towards are consumption lounges and getting a little bit more open with policy around consumption and how that looks. And certainly the future of that is very exciting, I think, from our perspective. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And how you're able to market that and everything else. Uh, before we get onto that, uh, we've got another guest who just joined us, Adelia Carrillo with High um, Event High and Blunt Brunch. How are you? Good to see you. Good. I'm doing good. Zoom was trying to do updates. I had no control. I apologize, yeah. but I'm here. <laughs> yeah. Um, are you at an event right now? Or are you at G4? 
Mm -hmm. Yep. At G4 right now, tomorrow heading to the Emerald Cup Awards after. All right. Terrific. You've been going to that for, for a while. Is that not uh, one of you and Ollie's favorite events? Yep. One of my favorite, our favorite events. And uh, we're excited to experience how they are transitioning to host it down in LA this time. So we're like, really looking forward to that. I want to ask you why it's your favorite event, but tell me about G4 since uh, this whole week is all about events. What's up with G4? Why are you there? Yeah. Uh, so I'm moderating two panels at the conference. One is about cannabis events. The other one is about marketing. Um, and I love it. I think you know, this is a great event that has a lot of potential, um, you know, they're building their following when it comes to this new component. They've hosted plenty of events down the road for bud tenders. So it's really cool to see the collaboration. I love their ticket component. Their ticket includes food, drinks, like happy hour, invites to events. So they've really made this ticket component really like a wow factor to, to attend. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> How are, how are people able to advertise these days? I'm going to, I'm going to go back to you, Adelia, and ask you how you're able to advertise. You can't do billboards or buses. Some social media are still canceling people that you don't hear about that too often. They've kind of gone towards more fake news than, than cannabis these days. Uh, so I want to ask the both of you about the challenges and even getting the word out. Um, Adelia, starting with you, what are some of the challenges that, that you're facing in that space? Yeah. So, um, you know, we hear from, we work with a lot of different event organizers. We're in over 48 states. And so we hear all the different challenges they're facing. Uh, you know, we're all very familiar with the social medias, the TikToks, everything, get them getting shut down or shadow banned. Um, so a lot of these event organizers or even from my end, when it comes to marketing, you know, it's almost like going backwards in a way, utilizing SMS again, utilizing direct email again, uh, getting creative in like, even with the events with experiential marketing for the brands to really have uh, customers or event goers get have all these different like senses being enhanced when they learn about these brands. So utilizing events too, as a marketing strategy um, are, uh, is another thing that we're seeing out here. Okay. Thomas, how about you? What are some of the, the challenges uh, that you're seeing in the industry in terms of just getting the word out? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think Massachusetts has some of the strictest regulatory laws in the country around media and advertising. And obviously you have your overarching class classification of cannabis as a federally legal substance, which takes out all of these major players like your social, your Google AdWords, et cetera. And so we, we usually dip back into some of the more traditional styles of billboards and uh, a lot of in-store retail marketing, lead gen capture through POS, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Okay. What's your favorite event and why? Man, so I was at, um, it, is, it is really event week. Um, I don't know if that's intentional, but uh, I was at LMC, uh, the Luxury Meets Cannabis Conference last week. Um, I'll be speaking on, a, I was speaking on a panel then. I'm going to MJ Unpack next week. Um, I think they're all really interesting and I love the nuance between them um, because uh, LMCC was very, very focused on product, on emerging brands, you know, a lot of scaling, a lot of talk of topicals, a lot of just more niche nuanced brands. Unpacked is really interesting too, because it's really for people who are in the industry, there's not a lot of kind of peripheral individuals who are coming to that event. Um, and, you know, it's hard to say that I like one over the other because I think they all fit different molds. Um, obviously, MJ Biz is also a crazy event in Vegas, which, you know, it's hard to not love the atmosphere of being with all of the people that you're working with collaboratively from packaging vendors to um, other people who are holding licenses and doing the same thing. So, you know, I think when I'm there, every one of them, you know, depending which one I'm at they always are my favorite because I, in the time I'm really enjoying basically trading war stories with all the people who are going through such a very, very interesting business challenge. And it's not always that you can go and talk to your friend, you know, who works in a different industry about the challenges because they can't honestly conceptualize how insane the things are that we're doing. So um, it's really, really nice to kind of commiserate with like, like minds. Seems like branding is is uh, coming up a lot today in the last segment as well. Is is that the the motive to go to these is to get the brand and awareness out there? Because typically it's been about the highest THC at the lowest price point. We're kind of starting to <laughs> debunk that as even the Emerald Cup we just mentioned is going away from the highest THC to get to, towards something that people really want, whether that's terpenes, flavonoids, whatever, um, you know, minor cannabinoids, whatever it is. I think we're kind of getting away from that other, 
you know, stereotype or, or um, general, general generality. So the, the marketing, the branding, um, is it becoming more about brands? California leads brands, Christopher, and, and with cookies kind of getting this global recognition, Christopher, do you feel like it's, it's year of the brands and, and are events the way to establish that? You know what I'd love to do is actually flip that question right over to Adelia. All right. One of, the, one of the great things in my inbox, I have to say, is the newsletter that comes out from Event Hive that has so many different events and the information, the links. I mean, it's really so comprehensive and there's so much exciting stuff going on. So Adelia has got the finger and the pulse of so much of this. I'd love to hear what you think about that. Yeah, well, first off, thank you for that compliment. We, we love that. We oh. hope more and more people see it because it's exciting, you know, all these different events that are happening. And that's what we love. We're seeing the creativity. Um, and yeah, going back to that, we, we definitely, we even start telling a lot of these brands that that is the great way to market themselves, whether it's their own event or whether they're participating in another event. Um, you know, it's just maximizing their, their footprint, getting in front of the right ideal customer. But then it's also two-sided. You know, you don't want to go to every event. Not every event is for your brand. So you have to also keep that in mind. You know, I think back in the day, pre-COVID, I know for me, I was going everywhere. I got so burnt out, you know, and now I'm re-looking at things and just being more mindful of like our time and our messaging and making sure it fits that audience. And I feel a lot of other brands are doing the same as well. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned, Adelia, that you um, have relocated recently. You were in the San Diego area and now you're in uh, Arizona, right? Yeah, yeah. Timing was perfect. We went right before they went recreational. Uh, so it's exciting to kind of see them transition. But it's also it reminds me back of like how California used to be with like the event landscape. You know, they still have an easier way to give gifting and sampling out there in Arizona. And, you know, the events are kind of still that that cool uh, lay, uh, approach. Um, compared to how California has transitioned with, um, you know, a bit more stricter policy. The events are still amazing in California, but, it, you know, they now have a CEO license, which makes it a little bit hard for these smaller events to afford that kind of licensing fee, you know? So um, it's, yeah, it's interesting. Going on? I saw you went inner tubing uh, when it was like 93 degrees or something. I'm going to pretend I'm not jealous at all being in Seattle. So we just won't even talk about it. Uh Thomas, when, when you guys are marketing or trying to market for Theory Wellness, uh, what is it that you guys are going after? Do you guys have specific criteria? Are you going the shotgun approach? What are you finding that's working and what's challenging? Yeah, so, you know, we're, we're, we have a lot of different strategies at play. So we have, you know, both a B2B to B2C component on our business. We're, we're obviously doing a lot of wholesale but we also have um, another sub-brand of, of beverages called High Five, which is honestly a standalone. So we have almost dual B2B, dual B2C on two different brands that we're managing simultaneously. Um, and what really I think works very well on our end is that, you know, we focus very hard in the first few years to get our core foundations right. So everything from our web stacks to our CRM collection to the data points we're getting and figuring out how we can effectively use that data. And a lot of it is timing your the right message at the right time with the right people. Um, originally, we used to be very a little bit broader about things, but as we continue to move forward in the industry and mature, we're working more on a higher frequency of touch, but with a more intentional a touch that comes with it. And we, we, <clears throat> oh boy. this is the most important part too. I know that was it. You're yeah. going to have to say that again, Thomas, that last part. <laughs> Sorry. We lost you again, right at the key moment, right? At the punchline. Oh goodness. In my back, it's showing that I have, I'm, I'm here, but I'm, I don't know what's happening, but you can, you can blame Christopher. It's okay. It's my, my fault. <laughs> no, it's, it's, no. it's probably the Berkshires. The Berkshires is, you know, if the wind blows too hard, your internet uh, oh, there you go. wanes there you and go. changes. But um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I think basically the point I was making is that we only speak unless we have something important to say for our consumers to hear, because if you overuse your voice, you talk too much, which I can do sometimes, which is probably why my internet's dropping out. Um, <laughs> But if you, if you don't have something important to say, you're going to lose interest in, with your consumers. And it's a sign of maturity to be able to say things to your consumers that they're going to want to hear. And we track that through our metrics. We track that through even asking them, how often do you want to hear from us? What do you want to hear from us? 
And we're always kind of building on that knowledge base to build a better uh, funnel for our communications. And that's really how we've, we've reached a broader audience. We've done a lot of media work in the past, but nothing is as good as giving a good message that somebody wants to hear at the right time that has relevance. So we're talking about events, you know, this week. And so as somebody who's going to these events, are you finding that you're getting most consumer touches for uh, any of your products, beverages or otherwise, are you finding that, that the events are the best way for validation and getting the, the word out? Cause I know that uh, when I was in Vegas recently for, for an app we have, we had a lot of downloads by going to there versus just trying to do regular traditional marketing. It's a lot harder. It takes a lot more skill and persistence. Whereas you can get that instant gratification, which is so Americana, you know, <laughs> if you go to an event. So are you finding the same kind of uh, situation where you're getting a lot more enthusiasm, validation, uh, hands-on and, and brand exchange at, at events? Certainly. And, and we, most of our participation in these events are on the B2B side. So the knee cans on the East coast, and we really only exhibit where we're obviously active in those markets. And so mostly for us, our B2B side is where we drive a lot of engagement. The event side we do on the consumer is, is a lot softer and we don't really go and exhibit at the unpacked or anywhere where there's not really a direct correlation to our brand where we can get conversions. Um, but again, o- o- hopefully over time, I think that event universe is, is really untapped, it's underserved, and the big missing component is consumption, simply put. And I'd be curious to hear, you know, Adelia, is that something, how, how much does consumption kind of impact events that you're seeing out on the West side? Well, so kind of more high level, we've been, you know, we track a lot of the news articles that are happening from state to state. And so a lot of states are actually talking about this. Michigan is incorporating this and really embracing events and consumption, which is really exciting to see. They also have a license there. So they have like a cannabis event organizer license too. Um, But it's still very, looking at our data and looking at the different states, there's still a good balance of non-consumption events. We're still seeing a lot of educational driven events, but now what's coming back again after COVID is we're seeing these festivals that are trying to incorporate or get approval to allow these consumption, um, like consumption lounges or consumption areas. Um, But it is exciting to see all these states like kind of starting to embrace it and try to figure out like, how are we going to do this? How do we incorporate it? You know, and even some of these state uh, political leaders or or mayors, they're even noticing like, hey, it's just like alcohol, you know, we can still have an event and just have it be cannabis consumption. So they're even now not fighting for us, but now voicing for the cannabis industry and consumption as a whole. What are some events coming up? What do you have on uh, Event High's calendars that you can share with us? Anything you're excited about? Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, now I can. Wait, something's happened. Do you have um, earbuds? It sounds like it's crackling. Try to mute and then unmute real quick and see if that works. I hope I'm not contagious. It, you, it's your fault, Thomas. It's not Christopher anymore. It's totally, I own it. Thomas's fault now. Can you hear me now? Should I take them out? Yeah. Yeah. Let me. Christopher will just do an interpretive dance of what you were going to say really quick, just uh, to buy it some time. <laughs> Is it now? I think so. I think so. I think that works. Yeah. Um, I, I hear you yeah. okay. Oh, there yeah, we go. I okay. hear you good. Okay. Yeah, all right. The long um, can you hear me? The long, uh, the world's so. longest dumb. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, I, I, I try to not be biased because there's just so many different events happening throughout the U.S., uh, you know, and again, we are in 48 states, but one that is two that come to mind, uh, there's one that's happening in Michigan, and it's called the Cannabash, and so they're bringing all these different performers to come into uh, to Michigan, and they're going to have vendors, they're going to have uh, consumption. Uh, another one, and what we're starting to see more of are like camping and retreats, um, and so there's another one that's happening happening in California called a Kind Bud Campout. And again, they're incorporating musicians, uh, activations, artists, just all these different components to really enhance this event. 
That sounds incredibly fun. It kind of goes back to that that duality that we have in the industry, really, like the the industry side and the community side. And the community side is some, you know, partly it's the the medical side, of course, the medicinal side, but also it's the fun side. It's the I mean, it's the Grateful Dead side. It's the, it's just it's just the joyfulness uh, that's sort of in the you know in the plant and sort of keeps us all uh, you know all enthusiastic about it. And and I just at any event, I hate to see if that is lost. You know, because that that joyfulness is something that's particularly special. It really is about the community. It is. And one other thing I wanted to add that we're seeing is dispensaries are actually utilizing events to themselves. So we're seeing a lot more events from dispensary owners uh, hosting to get people to come into their dispensaries and, you know, have vendor days. But they're now utilizing tickets, which is smart because now they're building a database of emails too to start, you know, sending newsletters and keeping them updated. Yeah, I did a story recently about about all the pop ups that are happening or are, are, are happening again, I guess, after COVID has sort of relaxing, uh, you know, a lot of those events. One thing I thought that was so funny, there's something um, I guess there's a it might be a, a I'm not sure if it's a brand or if it's a dispensary, but they're they're uh, branded around a Mexican wrestling. And so they actually had Mexican wrestling at uh, like the Luca Libre kind of a thing at uh, one of the dispensaries in Santa Barbara. Apparently, two thousand new customers came. Yeah, so you know, I mean, it's just fun. It's the, it's the, again, it's the fun part, right? It's the, that part we can't lose. That part. What about the issue of not being able to get to these events with the combination of COVID and high travel costs? Um, there was an event I needed to go to in Vegas, and they were trying to charge four to eight hundred dollars for the flight ticket alone. From Seattle to Vegas, and normally that's like a ninety-nine dollar ticket all day long. Mm. Um, so the combination of, of high fuel and COVID is that going to be keeping people away this season? Thomas, you're not in your head. Go for it. What's your opinion? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think the the simple reality is that there are a lot of economic headwinds. Everything from an increasing inflation rate that's up, you know. 8% or so, you know, the rising cost of gas prices, which are all being passed along to consumers. There is certainly a disposable income gap that is now getting very, very near, near narrow, which is going to impact pretty much everybody. And then you start to look at supply chain issues as well, which like, I'm sure everybody talks about supply chain and it's, it's because it's real. And I think we feel the impact of it. I'm sure events are feeling the impact of it. I think it's a really tough time, not just for cannabis, though, too. I mean, I want to be clear, it's not a cannabis specific issue. It's a global issue. But, you know, these things are going to have broader impacts. And I think the cannabis industry is somewhat weatherproof to economic issues in the same way that, you know, alcohol and spirits. But at the same time, though, these kind of additional things, an event is something that's almost like a nice to have versus a mandatory for operational needs, if that makes sense. And one thing to just from looking back at what we're seeing with the data, so we do have some good insights. Uh, with this past 420, um, we alone saw 250 events happening, which with the past two years, we did not see that in the event, in, in the cannabis event industry. So events are coming back, but yes, I agree with everything Thomas said is we are seeing those challenges. We are still seeing virtual events happening. People are looking at that still as building their community. Um, we're still seeing event organizers incorporate the, the, oh, I'm drawing a blank, the virtual and the in-person events uh, at, at the same time, because again, people still have certain reasons they don't want to travel or again, going back to what Thomas said is all those other additional costs now are, are definitely an impact. Let me ask you guys a question about the um, 420 and the impacts that, it, that maybe future 420s will have due to the pandemic. Because what I've noticed um, is since the pandemic, everyone's had to offer an incredible amount of discounts in the industry to get people into the stores. And now everyone seems to have a weekly discount, like Mondays is edibles or, you know, Mondays and Fridays are 30% off. Whatever it is, everybody has something, whether it's it's tax, they're getting out there uh, and they're offering these. And so when 420 happens and you don't have 50% off, it's not really drawing people in. I mean, I've been going to 20 stores on 420 for six years in a row, and this is the lamest 420 I've been to. And I'm wondering if that's also trickling down to events. Uh, are people just want to go and get and, and have a consumption event? Or are you guys seeing a, a reduction in overall enthusiasm for 420? So I can, I'll answer a part of, I can answer a part of this as my internet. 
Um, <laughs> so I think something that we noticed this year is that this 420, we actually saw a reversal in numbers between pre-order and in-store visits. So in past years, pre-orders have been much higher for all sorts of reasons. We opened in October of 2020 up in Maine, worst time of the year. So much pre-order was running. This past year, we saw this 20 to 30% growth on in-store visits by comparison to past couple of years. And what that signals to us is that people do want to interact. People are feeling a little bit more comfortable socially. And for us, that was kind of great. But overall, when you compare this past 420 to previous ones, it was a good Wednesday. It mm -hmm. wasn't a great 420. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what we've heard across the board. But again, the good signal for us and the future of events, I think people are clamoring for that interaction. And I think what we may see more of is smaller events with more personal settings versus massive events with so many people. Um, but I'm sure Adelia could speak much more clearly to that. Mm -hmm. You hit it right on the nail. That's exactly what we're seeing. We're seeing a lot more intimate events happening. If they are large scale events, it's again, festivals. So outdoor, open, like open floor pan, you know, just really spread out. Um, but yeah, definitely an increase in these smaller kind of more events. Um, again, I, I, I think I need to, I definitely should want to study more of like pre-COVID 420 to this last one. I, obviously the numbers, it's going to grow, but and, and I'm excited that, like I said, 250 were happening, but I do want to kind of dive in more and to see what the differentiator was. You know, were these all free events? Were they, you know, were they lower ticket costing or were they higher compared to 2018? Um, so I'm going to definitely look into that and I'll, I'll, I'll keep you all posted on what we find out with that. Um, but yeah, going back to, again, to what Thomas was saying, we are seeing these smaller, more intimate events happening, more retreats. Uh, and then if it is a bigger event, it's more festival kind of focused. Yeah, I know California's delivery of $65 minimums was causing people to go in to avoid that. And I think that's about the, the price and inflation uh, and, and everything else. People are kind of trying to go in and they're really bringing that price down. So it was about $70 you know, this time last year. And now the average item price of people going into California is under $65. So people are going in, spending a lot less, driving that price down. So uh, as Thomas's point was, maybe people are going in to you know have that interaction, and maybe a lot of people are doing it because they just want the, the price and convenience. They don't want to order a bunch. Pre-order is different than delivery. I understand that. That's a lot different. So going in versus pre-order, that's probably a lot more about that social thing. Uh, and the smaller um, events, definitely seeing a lot more regional events. I think people are kind of... Um, there's a lot of people who were over the the MJ BizCon and and that's what popped up with uh, MJ Unpacked is the alternative and that's brand new right mm -hmm. so you're going to have alternatives and I think that's great there should maybe should be a lighting show maybe there should be a dirt show uh, maybe there should be these individual shows and that's what normal industries have and instead of trying to lump it all into one uh, and have it regional because Oklahoma is not the same as, you know, Arizona or whatever else. So to kind of have that regional pitch or feel or flavor, I think is, is only an opportunity for some of these event planners to uh, go to event high and list it. <laughs> <laughs> nice plug. <laughs> follow up you, that's, um, that's exactly what uh, both Tim and Taylor Blake were saying. There's the Emerald Cup. Uh, founders that's just exactly what they were saying was they're looking forward to more regional events we Emer emerald cup has been all california you know all along but they're looking forward to possibly new york possibly chicago possibly washington those things uh you know and really spreading the word that way uh and getting people together around these old values that we've uh, developed out here uh and and moving across the country and really sharing the sharing the love and sharing the wealth and what i love about that too is it goes back like you're saying like like I, or I think you're insinuating towards it, the culture. It's going to keep that culture alive and that community and that heart and bringing the farmers together to showcase what they do. You know, going to Emerald Cup, one of the things that I love is you'll see it and there'll, there'll be little huddles of people just showing off what, you know, their own personal stash or what they just picked up and they, mm -hmm. they're geeking out about it. They love it. And it's, it's really cool to see that. That's the fun. That's the fun part. We're going to have to wrap this up. I'm going to go to a commercial break. We're going to have more all about the event planning industry coming up. So I want to thank my guests, both Thomas Wynn Stanley, VP Marketing at Theory Wellness, as well as Adelia Carrillo, Chief Marketing Officer at Event High and co-founder of Blunt Brunch. You guys, thanks for being with us. Appreciate it. Thanks, thanks for having so us. Much.
Don't, you. Yeah, don't go anywhere. You guys want to come back. We're going to be uh, here with some more guests at the Green Rush. Don't miss it. Don't forget to smash that like button on your way out and check out these other videos that we've got. <laughs>